So today, we're gonna to be doing some organic functional groups, experiment five, and that's gonna start out with looking at how Benedict's reagent reacts or interacts with some of these individual compounds. Every system is gonna be a little different, and you just gotta to try to pay attention to the reactivity of each one, meaning you should always take very careful notes. So let's get started. Uh, the biggest thing is you wanna be even-handed across all of these samples, So I'll give you a little look. I think I did pretty consistent work there. Roughly the same amount of liquid in each of these. And the big thing is, you know, the color of the Benedict's reagent is sort of a light blue, worth noting beforehand. That comes from the cotton. All right, so what we're gonna add now is about a milliliter to each of these. And a milliliter is about 20 drops, so I'll do my best to add a consistent amount across all of these samples. We're doing qualitative work here, so it's not gonna be 100% razor perfect. We'll do our best. Yeah, it looks like it's already starting to adjust the color to a slightly more yellowish green. It's bubbling. It's releasing some kind of gas, it looks like. can see if it's releasing heat, but something's happening in there. Worth noting. That was for the acetic acid. So there's some kind of slight reaction. Cyclohexene. Looks like something looks like it's forming two layers which is what you'd expect it's kind of a very organic reagent so it doesn't look like it's too soluble in the water maybe it'll increase in solubility as we heat up heat it up technical difficulty there so the hexane just gonna add 20 drops as before looks like we Next we'll do the toluene. So the toluene is going to be an aromatic compound, methyl group, basically uh, methyl benzene. It's pretty good at not being reactive with anything most of the time. So far for the last few, Virtually no visible reaction. When I tap the toluene, it kind of forms some beads. So it's more of a phase boundary thing there than anything else. And next we'll do the ethanol. It's pretty soluble, which is what you'd expect. Ethanol is pretty soluble in water always. Um, so far, no visible reaction yet. This heat acid is definitely a little different looking. It's a little greener. And then the benzylamine is the last one. So far, we're getting a slight color change on the glucose. So the benzylamine is our last specimen. Finally got it. So, benzylamine, and add the solution. It's worth taking note of the initial color of this one. It's not going to necessarily do a color change if uh, that's worth turning, like let's say if it turns to green because this is a little yellow. 
That's not like a real chemical color change, it's just a mixture. So it's worth noting that. It looks like we have definitely something going on here though. Um, that is reacting pretty well. Remember that this is not an aniline, this is a benzylamine, so it's going to be not quite the same reactivity. So, uh, so it's, it's a benzylamine, not an aniline. It's important to know. And now we're just going to let these cook for a second. They're all labeled, so you want to make sure that they are absolutely labeled before you put them in the hot water bath. And just keep an eye on them. Take note of the color beforehand. So. I'll go through each of them. So here's the benzylamine, strongly reacting already. I'll grab the other three. And so next we'll look at the glucose. Glucose appears to have some kind of reaction going on. Very mild, it's hard to sell because it's more dilute. So the cyclohexene, hard to tell if anything's going on, mostly just looks like it's mixed up a little bit, like salad dressing. Hexane, same story. Ethanol, not a whole lot. Very soluble, so you don't have a phase boundary there. Toluene. Same. And the acetic acid definitely reacts a little bit immediately. You can already see the benzylamine has changed since we mix it with this uh, hot water. So it's already forming two phases, one that is definitely not the same color that it started. So let those sit for a little while. Alright, so we've left these on the heat for about, I would say, an hour. Good amount of heat. And we're going to go through the results of our Benedict's test on these individual um, solvents and or reagents uh, that we mixed together. So first we have the hexane. Hexane would be what we call a negative on this kind of test. What you're looking for is any kind of precipitate especially a dark red or yellow uh, precipitate in this case, um, indicating the presence of copper oxide. Um, and we don't really see anything. It still looks like the original copper two. And in this case, I would say it would be a negative test for Benedict's test. So the Benedict's, Benedict's test is usually looking for a reducing sugar or an aldehyde that you're reacting with. And hexane definitely doesn't have either of those. So put that one down. What's next? So cyclohexene, cyclohexene has an alkene on it, but pretty much the same as um, hexane, cyclohexene doesn't appear to have done any kind of reacting at all. Next we'll look at toluene, toluene, same story, lovely color, but no reaction. And we'll do acetic acid. So even though I mentioned there was some reactivity, it may have been with some of the other reagents because um, in the case of a Benedict's test, you're always looking for precipitation as an indicator that the reaction actually happened. Um, and that creates copper oxide, copper one oxide in this case. And so here you have the same color as the beginning. Whatever small reaction happened wasn't what we were looking for in the Benedict's test. And this is our Results and negative. Benzylamine. Something strange happened here. Hard to say. Um, maybe the benzylamine uh, had a phase boundary um, that it, it couldn't really get miscible with the Benedict solution, but it was hot enough to be reacting. Something went on here. Maybe copper mixed with it really well or something odd, but we would still consider this to be a negative Benedict's test because you can still see the original colors that we were looking at before. 
and uh, there's some precipitate. You could say that this one is inconclusive or not exactly um, a positive result. Um, definitely like an unusual result that you are not expecting. All right, ethanol. You had an alcohol, an alcohol, an alkyl alcohol, and alkyl alcohol, and uh, it doesn't appear to have reacted, just as the others that you saw before. And then finally, what this test was actually designed for was finding reducing sugars. Glucose is definitely a reducing sugar and has reacted nicely here. Very, very clearly. Uh, if you look closely at it, it's hard to see from where you're sitting probably. There's some dark precipitate in there, and that's a good sign that this reaction has fully gone off and it was a positive result for the Benedict's test. So we're going to get started adding a little bit of hexane to all of these individual test tubes. We got our hexane down and what we're going to do next is we're going to slowly go through all of these compounds and see how soluble they are in this hexane. Um, remember when it comes to solubility like dissolves like and the important thing to think about that with the first sample is is hexane going to be soluble in hexane? I suspect it is. All of this, all of this hexane is soluble in hexane because it's all hexane. So we don't really have to do that first sample. It's not gonna be something that's worth our time. Next, we're gonna to go to the cyclohexane, hexene. The cyclohexene is gonna be similar, but it's gonna have a double bond. So it's gonna be not exactly a full alkane. It's got some alkenol properties. It's also circular. Um, it's going to make it maybe a little bit more nonpolar, but let's see how that goes. We only need couple drops just to see whether or not it dissolves. So looking here, I'm going to just double check that again. Make sure that I add the record to the solution. What you end up seeing is that there isn't any layer formed. Usually you'll see an immiscible layer, like you can think of you know, salad dressing, like balsamic vinaigrette or something like that. Um, and there are no phase boundaries. There is no separation of phases. And so we suspect this is what we would call soluble. Everything mixes together. There's no precipitate or solid in there. Um, you're gonna see everything mixed together evenly. So that's soluble in hexane. Let's see toluene. So is toluene going to be soluble in the hexane? Let us find out. So here we will have drops. A little bit more than a couple drops here, getting a little lip roll with these drops. So once I mix all this together, it looks like we also have a situation where everything is perfectly soluble. No color change, no reactions, um, nothing weird happening, just stuff mixing together and not forming any phase boundaries. It's nothing strange um, or that it, rather nothing insoluble going on at all. All right, so what's next? We have done toluene, we've done cyclohexane, we've also done hexane. Um, let's do, or hexene, rather, before. Um, so let's look at ethanol. This might be an interesting one. Let's take a gander. So the ethanol is going to be alkyl, but it's also going to have a very polar group on it, and that could definitely affect the polarity enough to cause immiscible behavior. So let us see. Make sure that we have enough in there. To see a phase boundary if there is one. 
it looks a little bit cloudy. So this one I might say is technically soluble, but it's a little cloudy, so that one is mostly soluble, I would say. It's hard to see. It's very finely cloudy, so, um, but still a transparent. I'm pretty sure overall it's soluble, I would say. If you can still see through it, soluble, right? Right? And then benzylamine. So benzylamine or we'll go for. Thankfully it's easier to get into the lid this time around. Just like salad dressing, if you shake it hard enough, it's gonna mix up, but it's because it's cloudy enough, I would say it's insoluble or slightly insoluble. It's still not forming a really tight phase as you would expect with like, let's say water and hexane. All right, acetic acid. Acetic acid is quite polar. Looks like we have full solubility with acetic acid. Oh, wait, I spoke too soon. On the bottom, there's a nice layer uh, of uh, a separate phase that's maybe easier to see up close. It's like a couple bubbles. And you can see that kind of the same way that you'd expect water to form a layer um, with uh, hexane. This is polar enough to separate as a completely different phase. So this would be what we call insoluble or immiscible. All right, and then finally, glucose and hexane. I'll give you one guess about how this is gonna go. That's fine though. I mean, glucose is somewhat non-polar but hexane is quite not polar. So let us take a look. Hexane is famous, what well, you would even consider probably famously non polar. Glucose, actually, more cellulose or big compounds made out of glucose, like polymers of glucose. They're pretty insoluble, but glucose itself, especially polar solutions, is pretty soluble. So if you can see this, you have the solid just sitting at the bottom. That's definitely insoluble. All right, so it's time to do the second part of part B. We have hexane. And uh, we're going to be taking this hexane uh, and adding it to some water. We have a little bit of water, about a milliliter, or a little bit more than a milliliter, um, just so we can see it better in all of these test tubes. We're just gonna see how water is soluble with these compounds. So it might take a little bit more than a drop. It's sometimes harder to tell uh, with solubility um, as just a drop. So you wanna see a phase boundary if you can. That's a great way to tell if something's soluble, and that's gonna take a little bit more solution. So here is some hexane into some water. And that should be enough. So are these two soluble? So if you look closely, you're going to see that this is going to have a phase boundary and it's clearly not miscible at all. They're not interacting whatsoever um, if they can avoid it, they won't interact. Um, and that's only possibly changed by maybe increasing the pressure or temperature, but for now, definitely insoluble at room temperature. All right, next is going to be cyclohexene. So for cyclohexene, I'll the same thing, I'll just take some of this cyclohexene 
added to the test tube and observe any kind of phase boundary. Again, this is an organic solvent um, and or an organic compound, and it's not going to usually mix extremely well with water um, if it's an alkane or even many alkenes. Um, and so you can, oh, it smells pretty strongly too now that's out of the hood. So it's definitely not soluble. It has a phase boundary. It would be classified as insoluble. Phase boundary, just a layer. Oil and vinegar. All right, next we have toluene. Toluene is gonna have maybe a little bit more polarity, a little bit, but not much. Not enough at least. So, although toluene is usually unusually soluble in a lot of different things, in a lot of different ways, um, it is not soluble here. Another phase boundary, another layer that's clearly there showing distinctly different polarities and miscibility. And so it would tell you it would be immiscible in the water. All right, benzyl amine uh, will be next. So let's grab that one. here because it's pretty smelly. Ooh. So this one actually formed a precipitate and that's a strong indication of insolubility. So cloudiness, definitely insoluble. Oh, but wait, I would say maybe mixed solubility. Maybe it was reacting with the water because it's pretty basic. It's also possible forming some kind of other compound. Looks like it's kind of cleared up. It's got a slightly white hue to it, or white sort of, um, it's a little brighter than it was to begin with, so it might have a lot of smaller suspended compounds, particles inside of it. Um, but it, it's definitely clear again, so this one might be slightly soluble or soluble. Amines are pretty polar, so that's not entirely that, that makes sense. Like, uh, that's sensible. All right. So next, we're going to do ethanol. Ethanol. I mean, I don't know what your experiences are with ethanol, um, recreational or otherwise. But uh, oftentimes, when you mix ethanol with water. They appear to be pretty strongly interacting. And since we are made out of water and we usually consume ethanol, it would probably be pretty dangerous for us to consume it if it was insoluble. And as you can see, no phase boundary here, totally soluble. So this is, you know, this is pure ethanol. It's added some water to it. Essentially just what I've made here is a little bit of vodka. Definitely soluble. All right, so next we're going to be working with acetic acid. Acetic acid mixed with water. It's going to be pretty similar to, well, I'll let you, I'll let you be the judge in a second. Is it going to be soluble? Yes, it is. And sometimes, um, Carboxylic acids are not extremely soluble in water, depending on how polar they are. But acetic acid is nice and small, simple structure. It's got you know enough ionizability. It ends up being just polar enough to actually dissolve, and you have solubility of acetic acid in water. And you'd expect that too. Distilled white vinegar is pretty much very similar to this mixture right here. All right, last one, doing a little bit of glucose, just a little pea-sized spot of it. And you can see 
see how soluble this is. Usually, especially with a little bit of heat, glucose is quite soluble in water. It takes a second. This water has to break up those sugar molecules and get them in the solution, but it is definitely soluble. Okay, so now we're gonna do the next part, which is gonna be part C. We're gonna just take a look at the way that a few indicator papers, like litmus, um, interact with the different aqueous solutions that we worked on in part B2. So every aqueous solution is gonna have some combination of hydroxide and hydronium, and that's gonna to contribute to the pH or the pOH. And what we're gonna look and see here is roughly how those uh, pHs are uh, with the presence of these organic compounds. So let's take a look at each of them. Make sure you pay attention to the notes in the actual lab manual in order to tell what each of these results mean. So the first one we're gonna do here is glucose. Make sure that you record any kind of color changes that you observe. Right. Acetic acid will be next. Get a fresh pipette. A little more on each of these. Perfect. That was acetic acid. We just put that one back. And next, we'll do the benzyl amine. Perfect. So record those results and consider what each of these color changes mean and think about what kind of interactions that these individual molecules might be having in solution, whether they're getting ionized or they're moving around and doing any kind of other reactions when you think about what would how they would affect the hydroxide or the hydronium concentration in solution. All right, next part. All right, so now we're gonna take some of these solvents and we're gonna interact them with bromine. Bromine, if you know already, uh, has a reaction with light to basically form two bromine radicals. And if you form bromine radicals, they can do a variety of other reactions that you might observe, um, depending on what kind of functional groups are in the individual molecule. So uh, in this case, hexane doesn't have a whole lot of functional groups, but we'll see if it actually interacts with bromine. I want you to mostly pay attention to any kind of color change that you see for this reaction. So here we go. And definitely make note of any kind of color change you notice. It just turned sort of a dark red or sort of an orangish, a um, little bit lighter than the pure bromine, but not too much different. Just a few hues lighter. All right, that was in the presence of light. We got this toluene. Oops, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> Maybe a couple drops in here. Some drops in there, and virtually the same color as the hexane. All right, so once we got these set up, basically we're just going to add a few more drops to each of these and see what happens when we take them out of light for five minutes. So. So there's a bit of a reaction going on here, clearly with the benzylamine. Uh-oh, dripping a little bromine here. Three, four, five. Put that over here. Same as before with the hexene toluene. 
that's for the toyway, no, pretty much what you'd expect. All right, ethanol, one, two, three, four, five. Maybe a little bit more, let's just make sure. Yeah, it's just the color, okay, cool. Maybe a slightly lighter orange there. One, two, three, four, five. Oops. <laughs> Making myself nervous here. And that was for the cyclohexene. Automatically went clear. And then we have hexane. One, two, three, four, five. And then we have the acetic acid, one, two, three, four, five. So for whatever reason, interestingly with the acetic acid, it formed an insoluble layer with the bromine, unlike the other solvents. So probably the three most unusual were the benzylamine, which appeared to react, the cyclohexene, which immediately, I mean, despite the fact I put just as much in there uh, of the uh, bromine water, it quickly sort of just disappeared, it doesn't have any color anymore. And then the acetic acid seems to have a solubility difference. Now I'm going to sit these in the dark and see if they react a little further take a look at them one by one. So the original two samples of hexane and toluene that we were working with are mostly clear now. They changed from a much light, uh, much more orange color to this sort of yellowish and to this almost clear color for hexane. Acetic acid, pretty much nothing has changed. Hexane, we have a small difference in color. Um, so you would end up seeing that uh, maybe some of that bromine is reacting. For cyclohexene, as before, it immediately reacted with the bromine. Ethanol, virtually the same color as before. And Toluene and benzylamine, pretty much the same color. They both reacted somewhat with the bromine, causing it to disappear. Remember that bromine is very colorful, and so the disappearance of that color is an indication of a reaction. And that should be about it for today. So that was experiment five. See you around.